welcome back to the Antidote Club podcast. It's good to have you with us again. Um, I'm here with Gillian and we have one of our favorite things, which is another client story for you today. And um, I'm super excited because it's one of my clients and I Yay. worked with Rachel um, last year um, over quite a long period of time, which was great. And she was such a great client in terms of her story and you know the little things that kind of happened along the way and I'm just so happy she said yes to coming on the podcast yeah it was really it was really uh, exciting to get to hear from one of your clients and the journey that she's been on from in the beginning when she tried the DIY approach right Mm. so I think maybe a lot of our listeners might really connect with that idea of kind of like spotting intuitive eating out in the distance or in the in those first kind of like oh what what is this and I think she'd um read um Megan Jane Crabb's book right yeah body, body positive power is that what it's yeah, called that's right was her entryway into this and being like oh mm. okay and I think that's what's great about these people on social media who um you know have resources like like books and podcasts and thing where you can really um feel like you're not really like buying into it or engaging in it or investing in it you're just dipping your toe in because you're curious of like oh actually I can I can not diet and 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 feel good in the body that I'm in what the heck's that about um and it really sounded like she was in that for about 18 months of like yeah and then trying to trying to um do that work on her own and what what I found really interesting was like what happened once she started working with you in, in compared to what wasn't really possible when she was doing it on her own and the big shifts that she made um, while working with you. So yeah, it felt, it felt great. Yeah, it was really interesting. And I think it was um, interesting to have a client come to work with you who'd done such a lot of work, but still needed to kind of, mm-hmm. you know, work through a lot of the body image stuff and, you know, really understand like you know, what it means when intuitive eating is quote unquote working or not. That mm-hmm. kind of stuff is really interesting because I think, you know, I, t- I did the same. It was a, such a similar journey. The mine was to, to hers when she came to me, that that was the first book I read too. And yeah, you know, there were yeah. so many similarities and um, also, you know, she's got a mum of young kids or sort of similar ages to mine and, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. They're slightly older than mine, but, you know, similar sort of dynamic and it yeah. just, yeah, it's really, um, it was really, really great working with her, but really great to hear her story again after such a, a little while since I, you know, we've worked together. So yeah, yeah she sounds like a real kind of ideal client of yours. Is she yeah. quite typical of the kind of people that you work with then? Yeah, yeah, she, yeah, she is. I think, I don't know whether it's because I'm a mum or not, but I do, I do tend to, I, I don't think I've had a client who isn't, um, hasn't got young kids. Yeah. Um, and particularly daughters, I think that's like sometimes the the catalyst for starting this work is you have mm-hmm. young, like, kids, like, daughters of preteens, and we, and, you know, and, like, she spoke about on the podcast, you know, she's got a son as well, and it matters to unpack some of this stuff for his sake. It yeah. isn't just about the daughters, but I find that yeah. that's quite often the catalyst of them starting this work. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, and I guess it's the circles that I kind of network in and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah, she was an ideal client insofar as that she turned up to the sessions like, this is my time to like, I want to understand this stuff. I want to understand why I feel like I'm getting it wrong. And I want this to be more than me just no longer going to the slimming club. I, it needs yeah. to be more than that because I can see other people are getting more out of it than that. Mm-hmm. So when's, I wanna my, feel that way. when's my confidence going to come? Like I've stopped dieting, like where's it going to come? And and, and yeah. that's what we, we helped to work through. And yeah, she's made some real shifts and changes. It's so awesome. And particularly at the end to hear her about how, how it's changed, like actually what's changed in her life. Like where is she, mm. where is she actually benefiting from this work? Um, it's great to hear. So yeah, yeah excited for our listeners to uh, hear from Rachel. So let's head on over to the conversation. Welcome back to the Anti-Diet Club podcast. We are really happy today to have one of Tamsin's previous clients here, Rachel Botfield. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, happy to be here. <laughs> so we, um, we're we excited to speak to you because you um, have been on quite a journey this past, I want to say maybe a couple years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. with... Um, 
Food and Body staff. So you're here to share your story today. And I'm really curious as to where you were at when you reached out to Tamsin and decided this, I need some help with this. Yeah. Um, I had started looking at intuitive eating before I came across Tamsin. Um, I think it was in a networking group and I saw her post something and I just thought, oh, I really need some help with this. I think it was towards the end of last year. So I think I bought the intuitive eating books like early on in the year. So I kind of like been looking at doing it and um, like working through the different exercises that were in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause I just reached that point um, where I just was just not having any more with diets and what I, I think with COVID as well, that I had a few stress things that were leading up to that and before uh, and during COVID. And I think that you've added a lot with a lot of people as well. You reach that point where you think actually no more, I can't, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Um, And so I can't remember where I came across intuitive eating um, to begin with. I'd read um, Megan Jane Crabb's book um mm-hmm. the body positive body positive body power yeah. yeah so i came across her i'm not sure where i came maybe it was on instagram and i'd started with reading her book and that kind of and then i had seen the um the anti-diet book with um christy harrison as well yeah, yeah. so i kind yeah. of dipped in and out of that um as well so i i knew that it was like there um so I kind of, I suppose I dipped in and out for maybe 18 months, kind of yeah. coming to, maybe just coming to terms with like fighting that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like wanting to stop dieting and, and wanting to get into something to be free and then thinking, oh, how can I do that? And yeah, so I just kind of, I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to something that I want to do. Like I love reading books. Learning and about kind it. Of, yeah, learning about it. Um, yeah. So I was... And once I started reading about it, really, it kind of opened that little crack in the door. Yeah. And then thought, actually, you... maybe it doesn't have to be like that. Maybe it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you mind me asking, how long would you say your dieting career was leading up to that point? It, were you a real hardcore dieter or were you somebody that dabbled and just was generally unsatisfied? Or were you a really committed dieter for a period of time? Um, I was a really committed dieter from when I had my kids. I kind mm. of dabbled, I would say, prior to having the children. Um, but I kind of think about it now and I just, I obviously just didn't let it get to me or I was too busy doing something else. But when I had the kids, that is when I felt the most pressure to mm. diet because I was like, oh my God, I'm the biggest I've ever been. And you get all these stuff about people snapping back to their bodies after they've had a baby and yeah so that was what I I joined um Slimming World and kind of got went down that kind of route and I was like a very committed obsessed dieter Mm -hmm. like its own I even I don't think I have actually recently thought about sins, but I literally was, everything was like a calculator for mm-hmm. like, how many sins is this? Mm-hmm. It was just like ridiculous. So I was always the person as well. Like when you talked about in some of your previous episodes about being that person that um, brings their own food and talks about like all the stuff around dieting, I was that person. I like, I was always talking about food, thinking about food. I worked away at that point I was working um, with my dad on events and we would go away and a lot of the 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 ladies that worked with us were um, very thin very beautiful I felt quite um, after especially after having the kids I felt quite out of place and we would all just obsessively talk about food and what we were having for lunch. And when, you know, we would travel to different places over Europe and stuff like, where can we go to the supermarket to buy some stuff for lunch that's quote unquote healthy, healthy. and not eat the Pringles and the whatever. And then ultimately mm-hmm. we'd all end up binging on the Pringles and the biscuits that were there because that's just what happens, isn't it? But yeah, so I was pretty committed. <laughs> yeah, I remember you saying to me, like, you know, thinking back to that time, but. It, it was so normalized that nobody nobody was like 
what you know you were really committed you were bringing you know doing all the stuff going to the supermarket bringing all your things to people's houses and stuff like really like calculating every last thing all the time like you said once you're on it you're really yeah. like gonna do it the right way but nobody says anything do they nobody ever no. says oh well you know maybe you just cut yourself some slack and then they're like yeah dig deep yeah, yeah. let's do it aren't you good yeah. you know what it was all about oh how do you and when I did lose weight it was like oh my god how have you lost weight apart from the fact that that pretty much all of these women were always pretty slim anyway you know like looking at it just mm-hmm. from a body perspective like yeah. we all were just obsessed with being thinner and making ourselves smaller and it was like I meant this one yeah so it was just like and it was it was like well how did you do that I'm like what are you doing now to like yeah stop yourself from eating this and how do you yeah. do it with having the kids and stuff and then it's like oh yeah well, I'm really proud of myself because I managed to just be on this but like I said to Tamsin before like I feel like I was on like juggling all this stuff or on this hamster wheel that like it was not just with eating it was like exercising and mm-hmm. then all this stuff with work and then if one little thing happened it would like upset everything yeah and then like you were totally spanning the work yeah you were totally off the wagon in all mm-hmm. areas yeah. do you know what I was thinking when you were talking about going away with these like thinner women who are you were all kind of bonding over diets I'm like do you know no one rocks up to these things and just be like this is a bunch of shit why are we doing this to ourselves (laughs) what like that's not the conversation right and I'm thinking that even if one of you had rocked up with that how much easier would it be for one of the women in a thin body to be coming you know into the conversation with that there's a real expectation of people in bigger bodies to even if they try and fail try and fail try and fail which is 98 percent of us right there's still an expectation to always be trying yeah absolutely yeah, because it's like, well, it was okay that I was bigger after I had the kids because I was. Doing, yeah, you were you were performing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, as soon as you stop kind of being the like good dieter, like the good you know person who's trying, you then you know everyone just assumes that you are not taking care of yourself. But actually, yeah. this is the problem, isn't it? We're pitching this stuff as taking care of ourselves when actually, you know, far from it. When you're in it you know nobody's realizing the lengths that you're going to in the extreme you know things that you were doing and you have children around that you need to be want to be taken Mm. care of and actually that preoccupation with food can be so hard and I would love to know like when you were in that did you feel did you kind of feel that it was just you that was finding it difficult to like lose the weight keep it off do all that kind of stuff did you feel like everyone else was just kind of fig- had this stuff figured out and that you were just still on this hamster wheel um, trying and trying? I suppose partly I did. Partly I felt like, because I think we often do anyway, don't we? Like with, as women or as mothers, as workers, we always think that we're the only ones that are kind of going through that. And it is hard sometimes to see past what you're doing yourself. But I used to like, I mean, in hindsight, now the ladies that I was working with, they must have been doing that, mm. you know, all the time. And they, the kind of work that they did, so they were doing a lot of hostess work. And it is so, you know, we just want the prettiest girls. We just want the thinnest girls. A lot of them had mm. done a lot of motor show stuff when they were younger, where they were wearing like hot pants and stuff like that. I mean, that in mm-hmm. itself is a is a, a problem. And they've obviously been made to... Yeah, it's a requirement of the job. Yeah. yeah. And... Yeah um although that wasn't when we were working with my dad but I remember one time um I wasn't picked for a job because I wasn't quote unquote blonde and thin enough Mm -hmm. which really really upset me that was like before I had the kids yeah though um and I guess I found it easier to brush off then but they must have been going through similar things but it's I think it's just because it's so normalized Mm. that you don't like I didn't it's only kind of looking at intuitive eating and and doing the work that I've done with you Tamsin and like now discovering all all the what is out there and and like looking at my own biases as well Mm -hmm. that you realize it's not fucking normal to do all that stuff and and when I was in it I thought it was 
so normal mm -hmm. and i find it hard to talk about with um people that still kind of ingrained in in diet culture even though um they might not be like hardcore dieting like i was there's still that element where but i still have to be mm -hmm. smaller and thinner there's still yeah. that thread that's attached mm. to it that we're not yeah. kind of good enough yeah yeah i i was thinking there when you were talking about not being picked for that that um job and Tamsin asked the question like did you feel like it was just you going through all of this and and I'm, I'm I'm guessing that you've kind of moved from this place of like at that point in time not being picked feeling like I'm the problem I'm not thin and, and blonde and this is on me to now waking up to the idea that no actually the fact that only thin blonde women get picked for these jobs is actually the problem it's yeah. switch switching around this this i talk about this all the time that it, this isn't a problem that lives within us it's a cultural problem that, that is then infuses through our minds and, and, and into our bodies right mm -hmm. um could you tell me then about about so you just you kind of came across intuitive eating you started learning you started reading some books you went through this like maybe 18 month period of like being curious and dipping your toe into it. And I think that's how most people start, right? It's like, what do you mean this thing of accepting my body? Like that sounds so great, but at the same time, like I'm super skeptical. Um, so what was the kind of um, tipping point? Like I understand you started to try and practice intuitive eating on your own and trying to find some peace and relaxation in your body, but there must have been something in you that felt like you weren't quite making the progress that you'd hoped to make, or you weren't quite feeling as differently as you would like to have felt. And that's why you engaged with working with Tamsin. What was that kind of, could you just speak to that sort of part of, of, of your journey? Yeah, I think that, um, I think it was the body acceptance really um i think i was still um not as much kind of in a bit of a binge restrict cycle that i was that i had got myself into um and more quite more severely before um covid and before i discovered like intuitive eating but i just was like i just felt like why because I was in a bigger body that I than I have been before and I'm still incredibly privileged with that but that was the bit that I couldn't kind of get over like why I'm trying to start doing this stuff I mean there was a part and I know you guys have talked about this before like oh when I do intuitive eating I am obviously not going to eat any chocolate because I'm just going to eat what my body wants my body's obviously going to want to have stuff that isn't chocolate or stuff that isn't quote unquote good for me or bad for me or whatever so um that was a that was like a a harder bit to get over and like trying not to make it into a diet mm -hmm. with intuitive eating but yeah I think it was mainly the body acceptance to think that I was so inspired by listening to and reading about other people's stories and it sounded so wonderful and freeing that I was like why can't I just get round mm -hmm. to feeling that Mm -hmm. and that was why I um reached out to to Tamsin when you and when you were going through like those stages well, I mean I remember a couple of points when we were going through like body acceptance and mm -hmm. like you know clothing changes and stuff how did you find that process like and that was when we were looking at the stages um of grief wasn't it looking at the different yeah. things there and that was quite hard actually because I got quite quite a lot of different clothes from and, and you know when some you know certain clothes mean certain things to you as well don't they from the event that you might have worn it to and then there was part of me that was sad that like I'm or oh, I'm never going to wear this again or I'm never going to fit into it and then like looking at well why why is it sad like and, and getting over that accepting it and, and and like we talked about my own um fat phobia in myself is that you know that's why I'm sad is because I'm not smaller anymore but then I don't want to be sad because I'm not smaller anymore because that's like mm -hmm. that's not what I want to um feel like so it was quite um it was quite a hard process and I did get quite upset in some of those stages mm -hmm. but 
I think as well, you kind of think of it as it's, you're going to, um, I'm going to do this, it's going to heal myself tick and then I'm going to be fine. There's not yeah. going to be any other work or days where I feel like that. And that's not the case, obviously, as you know. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's really helped me um, just come to terms with, with things and, and be kinder to myself in, in those ways and, and know that um, that it is more of a, I don't want to say journey because that sounds like too like, oh, I'm on a big yeah. journey, but you know what I mean? Like it, it is, is a journey, though. but, but yeah, is. so that kind of, um, that it does get easier. And once you start addressing those things and being really honest mm. with yourself about like why, um, cause you helped me look at, there was some tools kind of like sitting your feelings as well that we did. Mm -hmm. And those were really, really helpful to do that. Cause mm. you tend to, or I tend to, to, you know, like push those away or, mm -hmm you know, and it's, um, I don't want to say enlightening, but it kind of is enlightening that you yeah. sit in with those self and instead of, cause that's kind of what you did for years of diet culture, isn't it? You spent that time pushing all those other feelings, ignoring yourself really, and just yeah. going by all these mm. other cues of people telling you what you should or shouldn't be doing and what you should look like and things like that as well. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think Jill and I was talking about this this morning before we came onto the podcast about, you know, I, t I tend to work a lot with mums because I am a mum. And I think, you know, that I, I, I think the, the universe kind of puts me together with other mums who need help with this stuff. But I think it's very typical of us to be putting other people first because we, we, we are having, it's not that, hmm, how do I, like, it's not, I'm not saying it's something exclusive only to mums, but I think there's another layer of it. It's just like, you really just aren't your own. Your body's not your own. It's very kind of, it can be really, you know, unsettling, you know, when you're going through that stage, and like understanding, like these people rely on you and you've suddenly thrown into this world and you're, you know, even more so putting other people first and it's expected of us. I think it's mm. just so normalized, isn't it? That actually it's really, unusual to be sitting with our own feelings and asking ourselves what we want again we were talking about food a lot weren't we about like yeah well what is it what is it you like to eat I mean I think we started there right yeah. with what is it you want in the house you know what is it Rachel wants and you know like talking yeah, I still about think like that when I go shopping I'm like right yeah what do I really want and then sometimes I do surprise myself with things that I wanted before that and I think, well, I can just go and buy anything now. What can I buy? And there's actually, it's like, there's, there's like not that m much because it's the restriction thing. I found that, I'm not saying I never eat chocolate because that's a complete lie. And I'm like knee deep in mince pies at the moment because I like my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> but oh, it don't make me, it doesn't make me feel guilty anymore. And it just yeah. makes me think, actually, I've got some food here that I really want to eat instead of like, you know, eating whatever the kids have got and only buying it for the kids and mm -hmm. then eating it anyway, even though actually I'd rather eat something else and eat their Haribo yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So much of the time our food doesn't actually radically change that much, mm. right? It's just how we feel about it changes. And that makes such a huge difference to our well-being and our, our mental health. Um, what struck me when I heard you speaking about your process and your journey is it sounds to me like before you started working with Tamsin you kind of was learning a lot of the kind of intellectual mechanics around like the guidance around intuitive eating but the things that you named when you started working with Tamsin sounded to me like really confronting stuff like looking at grief looking at processing processing emotions looking at buying bigger clothes Honestly, I'm not sure that those are the things when people are going through this on their own and doing the DIY approach. It's really, really hard to do that difficult stuff when you're doing it on your own, because it's just like, well, I can close the book. I can turn off the podcast. I can walk away from this when it gets too hard. Um, and to have somebody to go through that process with and to sit with and be confronted with, and I'm sure there was a lot of tears and a lot of, you know, laughing and, and all of it comes out. Mm. But um, does that sound right that you maybe went to, to, to more difficult places that have maybe shifted the needle in a bigger way through working with Tamsin than what might have happened on your own? Yeah, definitely. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have, 
approached well i wouldn't have approached it the same way because i wouldn't have thought about some of those things to do you know what i would have carried on with following the book um you know and possibly ended up turning it more into a diet without even thinking about it really like saying about wanting to oh, i shouldn't want to eat that i shouldn't want to eat this and we talked about that didn't we when, when i first when i first started i think that it's it has been really valuable having somebody guide you and having that teasing things out that you wouldn't have thought of i've mm -hmm. you know it's it is really important i think like I, i've done some cbt this past year as well and um, to help with some of the stress and anxiety you know other things and that like built on what I did with Tamsin in in mm -hmm. terms of looking um like how I'm feeling and sitting in what I am feeling so a lot of that was crossing over I think mm -hmm. with um like the body acceptance and and <clears throat> what I was doing in terms of like eating and how I was feeling myself because they're kind of like stressing as well but I think Tamsin helped me build that foundation for going forward and doing the CBT because I don't know whether I would have done the CBT had I not mm -hmm. been doing some work mm -hmm. on myself, if you will, because it always feels a bit like, you know, and I'm privileged enough to be able to have had worked enough to get the money to, to be able to pay for that because I pay for CBT privately as well. Um, but I don't know whether I would have just done that before because even though everyone says it's okay to get help and all of this, it's like, oh, and I've kind of changed my tune on, on that. I think mm -hmm. having had this help and found it so valuable for me mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. do because um, I just don't think I would have done it on my own. I think I still would have been stuck mm -hmm. um, without having somebody help me. And cause you can kind of consume all the content you want, but, it's putting into practice is the hardest part even yeah. though it sounds really simple mm. that is the hardest part and mm -hmm. i think having somebody there really really helps and obviously you know tamsin's experience and you've got all the, the the um the exercises that we did and the like talking about grief i, I wouldn't have been able to name yeah. that had you mm -hmm. not you know talked about it and showed me and said about this and actually i would not have been able to name that as that mm. so i think that um having that extra support um if you can is yeah. is going to be really valuable and i you. remember you coming to the sessions and you we first started working together and you said like this is my time this is my hour for myself to invest in myself to you know get to where i wanted to be when you obviously started that journey for a reason to free yourself from all that mm -hmm. stuff but you you know you showed up with every session ready to 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 absorb ready to talk about stuff and ready to let it out and you know like actually prioritizing that as time for you rather yeah, than cuz it felt like i was being selfish like should mm -hmm. i spend this money on and and do that and it's like actually yes because like you talked about you don't we don't always prioritize ourselves generally anyway if we're and it's i find that kind of hard to think oh no i'll be fine do all this and then actually i was reaching the point of thinking no actually yeah i'm, I'm not gonna be fine yeah. i think it's just gonna make mm. it worse but you know i'm not a parent right so i you know i'm largely making this up <laughs> but i would imagine when when we think about you know not wanting to prioritize ourselves because kids are always needing our, our time and our money and the attention should go to them. And, and, we, and we're kind of indoctrinated into putting ourselves second as being the, the kind of caregivers rather than the care receivers. But I'm thinking as I'm listening to you talk, like the, 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 the one hour a week or fortnight or whatever it was, and then and then the money associated with that, which might be, you know, a pair of trainers for one of your kids or something. When you actually think about truthfully what's going to make a difference in their lives, right, from a really holistic point of view, if you take 10 steps back and think what is going to influence their lives more positively, it surely is going to be a parent who feels more embodied, more comfortable in themselves, who has a healthy relationship with food, um, who can model self-care for themselves and personal growth 
in themselves like that is such a great role model and to have a parent who has done that work ultimately it has to benefit them in so many ways in ways that you maybe isn't tangible it's not the same as like seeing something like oh I've, I've signed them up for swimming lessons or something it's not as tangible as that but what you do is you start to change the culture within your household and that's mm-hmm. really really invaluable I think it's it's really underestimated so um you know and I say that and I'm kind of like there's also part of me that's like and also you shouldn't have to justify it and here I am justifying it right yeah but but if we are looking for a justification I think there's a really good one there yeah I I agree and and that is something that worried me as well I've got a son and a daughter and worrying about like they still call baby bells mummy cheese because I used to eat them as my snack my my baby bell like they called it mummy cheese and I was like <laughs> oh it's, that's oh my mummy's having her little snack I was like, oh this is just awful and we lived off beans and my son can't even eat beans anymore because he was spending so many beans on Slimming World he's like can't <laughs> eat beans anymore <laughs> and I just and they're going through you know they're at that tween age uh in middle school and going through body changes and friends with things with friends and I don't want them I don't want to put that have all the all the all the shit that goes with you know how bodies should look and everything that I don't want them to do that especially I thought it'd just be my daughter but my son you know he struggles with some self-esteem things and he's you know and I it's the same I can see him struggling as as well and I don't want to I want to set a good example in that way to not make them feel those extra pressures Mm -hmm. because I mean they are going to reach a point at some age where I can't protect them or stop Mm -hmm. them from consuming all of that um Lily's really aware with her friends of being talking about being yourself like she's really they're all really big on that which I think is really lovely but Max does um he struggles with that and I bought the Bodily Happy Kids and mm, um, yeah, I haven't great. read all of it yet but um so did you say you bought it for your teacher I bought your, it for several teachers, te- several teachers. it's an yeah, end of year so. present that I give the gift <laughs> off I love it and I actually I had a teacher that. thank me great. for that I had a teacher saying you gave me that book and we, we never really kind of discussed it any further than that but at least she acknowledged that I bought it for her but yeah mm. yeah, yeah you had the teacher book. on which I love I feel like I'm episode. writing down all these book recommendations <laughs> yeah. because we always every episode we turn it into like a little bit of a book well, recommendation yeah we so need to re- recommend that one. book but you're totally right Rachel like um you know I think so often we we talk about how uh, girls and and women are affected by patriarchy but actually patriarchy doesn't work for the majority of men either right i mean arguably not for any of them but um they they suffer from it too right the way that we are conditioned to believe that our our role in society is x they're similarly conditioned to believe their role in society is y and that's Mm -hmm. not helpful for them either so i i definitely think it's like a cross-gender uh Mm -hmm. problem that we're dealing with and and i think that book does a really good job in in helping uh, it's just so hard you see that the things that they coming up against school it's the same stuff that happened when Mm. I was a kid like you know this is like 30 years ago when we was in school and their age and I just think haven't people grown since then surely opinion should have changed by now and then you're still coming up against the same stuff and it's just really frustrating because these systems of oppression are still at play and that's what's filtering down into any Mm -hmm. of the stuff that we're talking about and just to kind of you know go on to that point again about boys is you know, we need to be also letting them see, like not letting them have, you know, seeing that they can have um, a healthy relationship with their own body, but also to see that everyone around them, girls, boys, everybody is bodies change, bodies mm. change, you know, and it doesn't matter if yours doesn't change it. Other people's might, and that's okay. And like mm-hmm. un- understanding that, I think mm. that's really super important, but uh, it's yeah. all start part of the same systems that are just, yeah. Mm. And to your to your kind of point, Rachel, um, about all these, like, why hasn't that changed? If you look at um, statistics around other um, 
kind of marginalized identities and and the oppression and discrimination and stigma that's associated with um homophobia for instance for racism all those numbers are going down over the you said like 30 years if you look across that period the um the numbers are going down in terms of how people are affected by this fat phobia is going up it's the only it's the only like marginalized identity that is still going up when the others are going down. So that, you know, I, it kind of sticks in my throat a bit when I, when I think about that and repeat that, but that, that is the truth. So, that, so as much as I, I feel like there's a really big shift happening um, there's still so much to be done. So, and it does start with younger generation. Right. So um, yeah, can it, I have um, another question that I'm I'm keen to kind of follow up with? So Rachel, you you really eloquently described how this work that you've done on your own and then with Tamsin has really um, made some shifts in your household and how you range, raise your kids. But I'm really keen to understand how it's affected your life in other areas. So maybe you mentioned that you have your own business, so maybe there or in your um, other relationships or friendship groups, like what's, what's this work done for you in those areas? It's been really great for my business um, in terms of, showing up more and showing up more as myself so i wanted to get some brand photos done um and i did end up doing that in the summer um i met a lovely lady and she um was big on making you feel comfortable um and kind of like getting you out in front of the camera but i wouldn't have been able to do that had i not kind of like started this um like doing the work that i did with tamsin just because i was too scared to have them done and thought what if i don't like the photos and i spent all this money or i don't want to put them up online and what are people going to think and you know all those things associated with not liking um, our photographs and i was really really surprised i absolutely loved my photos i could not have had some better photos done and i really feel like they kind of capture me and i know i've had some really good feedback from people saying that they think that they look like me and like I'm doing some you know podcast moves on my hands and things like that but I really and they've really helped my website to personalize it and so that I can show people like who I am and um yeah it's really helped my website um because I'm able to put pictures of instead of just kind of using the the stock photos I can put photos of me on there to show like who I am and in my business, which I really feel much better about my website now. Mm. And I try to, and I use them in my social media posts as well, which is really great. So I don't have to kind of um, keep trying to take some selfies or use the same selfie thing. And it's helped me show up on video as well. I do do some little videos um, and I do some of them without makeup and because that's generally how I am mostly day to day. And I, it was a bit of a barrier for me. So I still kind of like stopped and started, but because I feel more, because I am more accepting of myself and, and how I, how I am. And I've just decided to just do them anyway, because, um, Otherwise, I just wouldn't end up doing them if I'm still waiting for, oh, let's just do my hair or do my makeup or, or something like mm-hmm. that. So I just thought I it has really helped me to do that because I wouldn't have done that before. I would have been too afraid to. I'd have just, you know, done hid. A, a typed post. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. hid, yeah. Hid. Yeah, um, it's helped me be more confident in doing some networking. Um, I went to an event last night and I was talking with a lady there that was talk saying about how she struggles to show up on video um without like worries about her makeup and how she looks and things and i was just kind of like talking to her about how i just do it now and she was saying oh that's really amazing and i wish i could do that and it did made me and i kind of brought up i brought up that i'd work with you tamsin and brought up the work that i have done and she seemed really like receptive to that and and something that she hadn't thought about before and i just 
I, I think there are a lot of women out there that struggle to show up in their business for fear of being judged of what they look like or they sound like. Um, and and I think part of that is how you judge yourself as well. And I think that because I've done that work, I mean, it is ongoing, you know, I don't, Worse. you know, every day, you know, there are some days I record the video about five or six times, I'm like, no, no, but, um, I think that because I have challenged those thoughts and my own biases, biases, um, that that has helped me kind of get over, like we talked about before, like shifted the needle in my change, um, yeah. of thought. And there are, um, I do, I do find that I talk about, I don't like bring up food or dieting, like with my friends or anything but I know that like, one of my friends is getting married and she was it there was a lot of kind of talk about about that leading up to her wedding um but I know that part of her doesn't want to care but then it does care um but so that was a bit hard I think um but on the most part I I, I, because I, when I was doing the dieting, I was very vocal about it, talked about it all the time, and I oh, yeah. feel like I was a bit of a nose when it came to it, you know. And then <laughs> we so all now, were, we Don't all feel like that. <laughs> I was, yeah. for sure. <laughs> so now, um, I don't want to, although I feel it's very important, and if somebody kind of, and I'm a bit more confident in in saying more what I think now, um, like a bit more down the line, um. <laughs> I don't want to push this on because I know that potentially when I was still in that position, I wouldn't have yeah. had any of it from somebody else because I was so, you know, stuck yeah. in exactly what I was doing. But, you know, if somebody is saying, you know, getting upset about about putting on weight or worrying about the eating and I just, you know, try and say, you don't need to worry, we don't have to it doesn't have to be like this kind of like, but more mm. in a um, positive, you know, just try and help. Compassionate way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Rather than trying to educate people who are maybe not ready yeah. for that anti-diet yeah. message, like the full yeah. works. Yeah. 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 I think we've all been at that point where we've, you know, wanted so badly to sort of share this mm. work and the freedom and the things that you, all the things that you feel and you kind of, you know get further along in the journey not out the other side because we always talk about there is no real end but we just want to tell people but you know mm. you don't have to do this you don't have it doesn't have to be this way and I know you're pretending it's easy and I know that it's not be but we, yeah. we know that we it backfires so often doesn't it like when mm. we kind of venture <laughs> yeah. down that road yeah. yeah 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 it sounds like you've really been on to use your words quite a journey and um <laughs> yeah it is ongoing and I think um, I really want to thank you for coming and sharing your story because um, I know that our listeners love our client stories. They love to understand what people's processes have been like. And I think it does encourage people to hear that, you know, I... I was in your position and and this is and this is what was scary and this is what I tried and this is what didn't work and and um and here we are so um yeah thank you so much for your time and um we'll put all the links to everything that we've mentioned in the show notes um yeah, yeah thank you well, yeah thank you for me. being so I just and can't recommend you enough Tamsin about the help that you've given me so and I'm really glad that I discovered you and you as well Gillian and the podcast because it does it gives me that boost on the days where I'm feeling mm -hmm. um on the harder days I yeah. just put on an episode and listen to you guys talking and it always helps me kind of like recenter and think actually this is I feel better going forward so thank you very much oh. yeah that's really good to know because that's, that's what it's so here nice. for isn't it yeah. yeah 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 thank you so much thanks Rachel bye bye, bye.